So we're doing this tonight for International Women's Day, which is coming up. The theme this year for International Women's Day is inclusivity. And it's really important for us as an organisation that people are listened to because for far too long people haven't been listened to enough or properly when it comes to menopause and perimenopause and hormonal health. So it doesn't matter your background, the country you come from, your ethnicity. We're here to help and help you become part of a really important conversation. So today I'm delighted I've got Pfizer Kennedy with me, who's one of our pharmacist and one of our lead clinicians who's been working with the organisation for a little while and we're going to answer some of your questions. We've had a huge number of questions that have come in so we've picked the ones that we think are most relevant to as many people as possible but we do have a huge amount of free resources available that we're adding to all the time. Actually the first resource that has got isn't free, it's my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, which has got a huge amount of information in, but there's also a lot of information that's free. So go yes. for it, Pfizer, explain a bit. A bit about, I mean, we have lots of different leaflets, um, uh, for some specific in different languages, and I think this is absolutely key. Just arming yourself with information is so important. Mm. Um, and I think having, having this information, preparing, helping you just decide what questions you have when you're seeing a healthcare professional, they're just yeah. incredible. So we've got a lot of book, booklets. The top one Pfizer was showing is actually for women who are living with HIV, and that's being translated to 22 different African languages by people in Africa um, which is so important because it's reaching the people that really need. We've got a lot of information that isn't booklets that is just articles that we're adding to all the time um, and if any of you've got more ideas of more topics obviously ask us and we're working on translations as well. Um, I've recently come back from Norway and some of the posters, the awareness posters, we translated into Norwegian. Um, so lots of things that we're working on. So let's get through to the questions, shall we? Do you want to ask me the first one? We've got a great one to start with, Louise. So, and I think this is such an important one. So it's about how do you prepare for an appointment with mm. a healthcare professional, with, with your GP, if you are having symptoms. So just talk us through yeah. some of the top tips. It's really important, isn't it? Because we, I'm saying we hear a lot from people that are struggling, mm. but we also actually hear a lot, and it's a lot more than it used to be eight years ago when I started a lot of the menopause work. A lot of people are getting really good results from going to see not just their GP, but their pharmacist or a nurse or um, a specialist. So things are really changing. But actually, we were talking to some of our clinicians today. And for me as a clinician, what I really enjoy is somebody, when I see somebody who's really sort of done their homework, they've prepared, haven't yes. they? They um, know more and they've got more understanding because we work out of guidelines. And actually, one of the most important set of guidelines I think as a clinician of the shared decision making guidance, don't you? Yes, absolutely. Because they allow people to have a choice. They can actually make a choice that might be different to what the clinician says mm -hmm. or, or, or wants as well, as long as uh, the, the patient is, has, um, is a consenting adult, has in, informed consent is really important. Mm -hmm. But people can um, make their mind up. But also the other thing that's important is that they can change their mind as well. Mm -hmm. And I think often people think, what they decided today, they've got to stick with that decision. Mm -hmm. And you might decide something now because somebody might have told you HRT is dangerous or it's going to cause breast cancer. And then you've got these really big fears and it's quite hard to change a perception. But then you might have read more information about the safe types of HRT that we prescribe, how the natural hormones are very safe, aren't associated with the risk of breast cancer. And then you might decide you do want to take HRT, but think, oh, I can't because I've had a conversation already. So it, it's quite all right to change your mind, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's writing down your thoughts as well and writing down your questions because often the time is limited when you're going yes. to see your GP so if you've done your research you have the yes. your questions written mm. down it can make it much easier and the consultation much easier and then I would also add you know with the balance app you can track your symptoms over time yeah. and then download a health report and that just makes it easier for your clinician as well to try and join the does. dots. And, Absolutely yeah. and certainly a lot of people say to me well the consultation often now quite rightly when, when there's time pressure 
It's one problem, one consultation. Yes. And then women say, well, do I go to the eye doctor with my joint pains or my headaches or my urinary symptoms or my low mood or my poor sleep or yeah. my palpitations? And all of those, as many of you know, can be related to the perimenopause and menopause. Yeah. But as clinicians, we can only act on what we're being told. So if someone only tells us about their palpitations, then we will focus on their heart. Whereas if they come with a, the, the balanced health report, with the questionnaire all there, mm -hmm. we can quickly scan down and think, oh, actually, it's not just palpitations. You're also yes. having these other symptoms. And have your periods changed? Do you think some of it could be related to your hormones? And, and then the, the narrative is so much easier. Um, what is the big problem globally is that there's still inadequate education for healthcare mm -hmm. professionals. And that is changing. As many of you know, we've uh, produced our Confidence in the Menopause course, which has been going for a few years, but it's been revamped recently with a team of people that have worked really hard to make it even better, more evidence-based. And we've had over 32,000 downloads of that. So every conference I go to, people tell me how great the course is, um, which is wonderful because it's, it's, there's a lot of practical prescribing tips. Mm. There's lots of information about how to talk to patients, how to get the best out of the consultation, and also based on evidence. And actually having resources beforehand can be really useful. Yeah. So when patients are empowered with information, it can be easier. But sometimes, and we still hear people who are told that they can't have um, hormone, hormone replacement therapy even though they want it because they've been told they're too young or too old or they've something else. And so if you have the information yourself and actually go with your expectations and say to your doctor, this is um, me, I think I'm perimenopausal, these are my symptoms. I would now like to spend the next nine and a half minutes talking about treatment choices for me. And I have decided I would like to try whatever treatment that you want. Yeah. And then as a doctor or the pharmacist, you know from the start, don't you, how that yeah. consultation is going to go. Absolutely. And I think also trust, trust your own gut and trust your loved ones, you know. Quite often we find that we accept symptoms as just part of growing older mm. or just normal, mm. a normal part of life. Uh, and we were talking earlier, weren't we? Where yeah. when I started experiencing symptoms, I was grumpier, and it, and I was just told, well, that's it's normal to be grumpier with your with your husband. But why should that be? Why do we accept things like yes. that? You know, and trust the, really trust your gut when you know that something is not normal for you. Yeah, I think you so. Know. And I think it's also, it is useful for us to hear like why someone wants a treatment as well. Yeah. And so if someone comes to me and says, look, the worst symptom I'm having is this, I yeah. would, I've explored all the options and I would really like to try this treatment. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is actually is a lot more women are considering hormone replacement therapy to improve their future health. Some of the guidelines say we don't give it for reducing risk of heart disease, for example, but there is really good evidence, as I'm sure you know, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm constantly posting um, evidence, as are many other menopause specialists globally as well. So it's an individual choice. You know, I've said before, one of the reasons I take HRT is to reduce my risk of osteoporosis. I'm very scared of osteoporosis. And so having that conversation actually can help tailor the, the um, consultation a bit better. But if you feel you're not getting the right help or support or treatment or advice, you are allowed to see someone else. And part of that consultation, you could say, look, I'm realising I'm not getting anywhere. How about, um, is there someone else in the practice that I could see? Um, and increasingly, people are being trained. So it is really worth uh, making sure you're heard because for many of us, menopause lasts for decades. Some people, it can be the majority of their life if they have a younger age when they're menopausal. Um, but maybe go with someone as well can be very useful. Have someone who's an advocate for you and can talk up for you as well. And as Pfizer says, write down a list of things as well because that can be very useful, especially if you're a bit nervous and you know the time is limited, then get the most out of your consultation. So the next question is, does menopause affect women from different backgrounds differently? This is an interesting one, isn't it? And mm. like all things in menopause, it would be great if we had some more research in this mm. area. But I think I'd start by saying probably there's more similarities between all of us than mm. there are differences. But I guess if we overlay things like 
different cultures, you know, so menopause is often seen as the end of fertility mm. and in some cultures that's that's the, a woman's main currency and mm. so they really, it's kind of a hush subject yes. and they don't want to talk about symptoms. So I think there's that uh, in in others, you know, actually your period stopping is kind of great. Cause liberation. It means that, yeah, liberation yeah. and uh, less hassle and, and uh, you know, it means that they can pray mm. and, and it, they, they don't have to kind of think about periods, etc. anymore. But I think it's also about language, mm. you know, and how we describe symptoms. Mm. I remember previous to this role, I used to work as a medicines optimization pharmacist in small towns and villages around Cardiff. And I'll never forget this one time where a patient came in and I was actually learning how to help patients come off opioids and trying to optimize the medication. So I was observing another clinician just to learn more. And she described feeling bad all over. Mm. And, and the fact is she kept saying, I can't even get out of bed and I, you know, I, I, I can't seem to feel any joy. And I remember afterwards in the debrief, the clinician I was observing just said, oh, look, Pfizer, keep away from that patient. You won't be able to take her off her opioids. Um, you know, and that, that might be one that you just skip. And I just feel so sad just thinking about mm. it. But I think it's about language. What does bad yeah. all over mean? How people describe their symptoms does vary quite a lot. And it's just trying to, you know, if yeah. you say to pa some patients, do you feel anxious? They'll say no. But then in the same breath tell you they can no longer drive, for yes. example. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a bit about culture, also about attitudes. So some, a lot of women will say, well, I hardly have any symptoms. And they just accept the fact that they, mm. I don't know, having such severe hot flushes that they have to have a change of clothes with them when they go to work. Yeah. So I think there's, there's language, there's, there's how people view symptoms and just think, well, actually, this is natural, I'll just have to get through it, mm. which is another thing we talk about quite a lot, don't we? I think <laughs> so. About, yeah. And there's a lot of communities where, well, most of us learn from our friends yes. and, and people that we're close to. Yeah. So there are certain communities where no one's ever taken hormones. Yes. So it, it is quite a taboo yeah. and it's something that people think it's almost they have to give in to taking hormones or yeah. they'll battle through their symptoms and take hormones as a last resort. Yeah. But then the other thing is, if you ask people what menopause is, um, even in the media, a lot of the talk is about flushes and sweats. Yes. So if you say to a woman, are you having any menopausal symptoms, if they're not getting flushes and sweats, and many of us don't, yes. then you would say no. And then you put down your symptoms to other things. Um, yeah. And so culturally there's always this talk that Japanese women don't have menopause because they don't have flushes yeah. and partly you know their diet is different yeah. they might not have as many symptoms but I tell you what there's a high incidence of osteoporosis in those women yeah. um, so it's not all about symptoms is it that's no. the other thing yeah and it is it's the future health and mm. investing in future health but yes that goes to attitude of grinning and bearing is something yes. that we we grow up learning how to do as women don't we yeah and so it's yeah and in different cultures it can be very much just not talked about. Yeah and yeah. I think it's been really aware of the symptoms so I was listening to a podcast this morning and someone said there's 19 symptoms of the menopause I was like really 19? Mm -hmm. oh, I think most of us could say a lot more because yes. as I've said before our hormones work all over our body yeah. so not everyone's going to get every symptom are they? No. But symptoms can come and go or change yes. um, but being aware of all those symptoms because some people it might just be headaches or it might be um, some joint pain yeah. and and you know and, and culturally and so in some languages you don't have words for all the symptoms I mean they don't even have words for yeah. menopause but you know vaginal dryness I don't know how that can be translated in all the different languages or it will be such a taboo to talk about your vagina yes why is that it's really important yeah. so absolutely and then also where you live right so mm. if you grew up in Africa which I did it's really hot so mm. you know if you're complaining about hot flushes it's like come yeah. on yeah so i think there's that but again going to the joint because symptoms can come and go for mm. an individual patient and not you know no two women are the same mm. in, the, in the way they experience symptoms or the way they describe it yeah. it makes it really difficult to join the dots which goes back to the point we were making earlier about just writing things down mm. because 
sometimes in the business of life we just carry on and don't actually realize some of the symptoms and then if you think back you think actually yeah I did have a headache yeah and I've had one every day for the last few yeah. weeks you know and then it helps you just join the dots I yeah think. and I think a lot of symptoms can be normalized because a lot of people think oh it's because I'm older yes. or because my mother was like that so to so really try and take a step back yes. and think about the symptoms but also the future health risks as well yeah. um, so it, it is important but it, it will change in yeah. different uh, different countries different um, ethnicities as well but we've still got a lack of research as well about, about that yeah. so do you want to go for the next question the next question is around you know can tiredness uh, how do you know I guess how yeah. do you know if a symptom is related to hormones mm. or, or actual just life stress, work stress yeah. or busyness of life. It's a really so interesting you know? question, isn't it? So I was speaking to a patient yesterday who's 42 yeah. and she actually only has symptoms. She has one day a month that she just goes to bed. She said that she just has to do it. She's done it for years. But she said, the more I spoke to her, I said, are you okay the rest of the time? Yeah, I'm absolutely fine. I said, are you really, are you exactly the same? If I'd met you 10 years ago, would you have exactly the same, you know, quality of life mm -hmm. other than this one day? She said, well, I am more tired. I am a bit forgetful mm -hmm. and I, I don't sleep very well. She said, I, I'm sort of not, so often quite irritable with my family, but I've got mm -hmm. three children and my, my, my life work's really busy. And I said, well, throughout your cycle, is everything exactly the same? She said, well, no, because when my period comes, then I feel fine again. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so you're already telling me you're having some hormonal changes. Yeah. Um, so that is a real giveaway. If, thing, if, if there's a pattern to symptoms, yeah. and sometimes it has to be someone else that asks you, because when you're living with yourself, you don't really see it. No, but a lot of women come with all sorts of symptoms, and we have no idea, do we, how many symptoms are related? Because, as you know, hopefully, many of you listening... There's no blood test, there's no saliva test, there's no urine test, there's no scan that will say you are perimenopausal or menopausal. Yeah. A guide is whether people have periods, but actually a lot of people have regular periods and are perimenopausal. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of, some people don't have periods anymore either. Um, so then it's, it's a pattern recognition, but we don't always know. So a lot of women I'll say to, I have no idea how many symptoms mm. are related. So this lady might be stressed at work mm. and some of her stress may be related to hormones. It's impossible to know. The only way of knowing is by having the right dose and type of hormone replacement and then seeing what's left really, isn't yes. it? And, and often it's a combination of, of nutrition, of lifestyle, about sleep, about stress management. Um, but then it's putting all those pieces of the jigsaw together, but you have yes. to start somewhere, don't you? Um, and if it is the work that's causing the stress, often when you feel better about yourself, you've got less menopausal symptoms, yeah. it's easier then to look at your job and think, am I in the right job? Have I got the confidence to change jobs or yeah. go for something else or speak to my line manager about what's going on? Yeah. But it can be very all-consuming when there are lots of other mental health symptoms as well, can't it? Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting you say about sleep. So. Generally, when I'm mm. talking to a patient, it's always starting with that sleep, nutrition, yes. HRT, because actually if you're not sleeping well, that could be oh, a cause, yeah. couldn't it? And so many women have disrupted sleep yes. when, they, when they start experiencing uh, perimenopause and, and menopause. And I think the other thing to say is, yeah, there are other conditions where there could be mm. an overlap. So if your thyroid function is off, mm. you could feel tired, couldn't you? Or if you had heavy periods and you had low iron. Yes. But I just, like you say, start with natural, replacing your own hormones, yeah. then take a broader lens and perhaps, if not all symptoms have improved, then kind of take a deeper dive yes. and more investigations for those symptoms. Yeah. Uh, but yes, there's no way of knowing for, you know, absolutely. No, and absolutely, we would never put everything down to the menopause. No. That would be completely stupid. But, you know, we're trained, you know, we're, we're yeah. family physicians. You've yeah. got a huge amount of experience as a pharmacist that yes. we speak to people all the time and you can have more than one condition. So yes. people might have arthritis, as well as being menopausal and have joint pains due yeah. to both. Yeah. Um, it's, it's absolutely fine to have more than one diagnosis and we're constantly reviewing and assessing patients too. Yeah. Um, so, but if you do think any of your symptoms are related to your hormones, don't just put it down to work or, or something else as well. So 
Let one lady's um, asked a question. She's 62. She's on HRT. She's on the natural patch. So the patch, um, the pure oestrogen patch is estradiol, goes in through the skin, straight into the bloodstream. And the micronized progesterone, which is the natural body identical progesterone. So she's had some bleeding. She's had some tests. An ultrasound's fine. A biopsy's fine. Um, she's asking, what about the marina coil? Another really great question. I think there's a couple of things we should say first of mm. all. Is that whenever you start HRT, bleeding is very common, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's the <laughs> biggest reason I think that people stop HRT yes. because of bleeding. Yes, but it tends to settle. Yes, it you know, does. and once we get the dose right, and it it can take a bit of time. Mm. And I think we mustn't compare to our friends, right? Because I always say comparison is the killer of joy, but it can take a time, uh, some time to settle. Mm. But it's usually about just balancing the hormones, getting the right dose and type, like you say yes. before. And there are lots of options. That's mm. the other thing that we're so lucky to have different options yeah. available. And so, yes, one option of having progesterone is as a, a, a capsule, an oral capsule. And some women don't get on well with it. And then Myrene is a really good option. Mm. And I think it d doesn't really, there isn't an age limit as far as I know no. on Myrene. And you can have it at any time. And the great thing about Myrene is that it acts as, you know, it, it helps balance the effects of oestrogen on the lining of the womb. And it, it can it lasts for five years. So yeah. you almost can forget about th that part of it. And it's so much easier. And if a patient is having heavy bleeding, it's also a really good option, mm. isn't it? So, yes, there is no age limit of having Mirena, and it's great just to have another option if yeah. you don't get and on. And it the works capsule. as contraception, doesn't it? Works it? As contraception which is good. As well, um, yes. And we have a lot of patients who come back every five years just to have yeah. the marina coil replaced because it can be really good. Yeah. Very low dose. It's not the natural progesterone, it's synthetic, but it usually only works locally. Um, and sometimes we change the dose of the progesterone, don't we? Mm. So if someone is bleeding, mm. we might increase the dose of the progesterone or we might suggest to use it vaginally rather than orally because then you get a better concentration on the womb. It's, it works, it gets absorbed straight into the bloodstream through the mucous membranes of the vagina. So there are always options. But as you say, if someone's had their HRT changed, mm. like the dosal type, yes. or initiated, started, then we always say wait three to six months. Yes. Um, unless the bleeding's really troublesome or it's worrying the person, because it does usually settle with time. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people go and have investigations almost too soon and mm. they haven't you know, let um, everything settle down. Sometimes it can be the dose of oestrogen needs mm. changing, either needs increasing or decreasing. Mm. Everyone thinks it's high oestrogen that causes the problem, but sometimes low oestrogen can destabilise the lining of the womb as well, can't it? Yeah, and that's, such, and that's a really key point to make, actually, that at the start of treatment, it takes some time just to individualise mm. that treatment plan mm. for that patient, and we are all different. Yes. And like you say, it's about finding the right dose of oestrogen and progesterone so that the lining is nice yes. and stable and it could be increasing or decreasing either, yeah. couldn't it? So, yeah. um, so it's always worth it. getting to, I mean, there are also there are other reasons for bleeding. So I've seen a lot of women, obviously, over the years that have had bleeding, they have a scan and they're found to have a polyp or a fibroid or something else that's unrelated to yeah. their HRT. So it's not always the HRT that causes bleeding. Yeah. So certainly if someone's having bleeding that's, that's, that's come more than three to six months after starting HRT or changing the dose, or it's persistent or heavy, then certainly it's worth getting it checked out as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then going back to the point we're making about just keeping a record, you know, yes. so if you know you've changed the dose, yeah. almost expect it, keep a record, because that, that will help your clinician decide what next. Yeah, isn't it? absolutely. Yeah. So the next question, Louise. So uh, this is a really great one where this patient has two blood cl clotting disorders, factor V Leiden and protein S deficiency. She's had no history mm. of thrombosis or clots. Can she have HRT? Well, yes, she can actually. Certain types of HRT. And it's a really good question, isn't it? So there are lots of people who have had clots in the past. And we do um, some work with Thrombosis UK, um, which is a fantastic charity for people that have had clots. There's lots of genetic conditions, so protein S deficiency, factor V Leiden, are uh, it's sort of mutations really in the genes that mean that people are more predisposed to clot. Um, so if someone's got a higher risk of clot, doesn't mean they've had a clot, 
or there might be someone that's had a clot in the past, we wouldn't recommend them to have um, tablet oestrogen or a synthetic progestogen. So the old types of HRT that we used to prescribe, we used to prescribe a lot in the old days, um, the tablet oestrogen metabolizes through the liver and changes um, and sort of activates the liver to produce more clotting factors. So it's shown to have an increased risk of clot. It's about a double risk, which isn't much when the risk is low, but if you've got a higher background risk, increasing that risk further is something you don't want to do. We also know the synthetic progestogens, so not the natural body identical progesterone or the marina actually because the dose is so low, but the others, there is a small increased risk of clot. So you would say no to tablet oestrogen and no to a synthetic progesterone, whereas actually the natural progesterone, Neutrogestan in the UK, um, and the transdermal through the skin oestrogen is absolutely fine, and testosterone actually, because again it's through the skin. Yeah. And so bypasses the liver, it doesn't yes. affect your clot risk at all. So. Yeah, and, it, and vaginal hormones as well. So I did a, a webinar for Thrombosis UK about a year or so ago, and there was a lady who was talking about her experience. And she had um, really bad vaginal dryness, very difficult to sit down. She had lots of urinary tract infections, really struggling. And she had m most of the menopausal symptoms too. And she was told she couldn't even have vaginal hormones. And I understand why, because if you open the insert for vaginal hormones, they'll always say on the insert, risk of clot, yeah. risk of stroke, and it's wrong. The yeah. vaginal hormones don't get absorbed into the body. That's why they're safe for women who've had breast cancer as well. Um, and obviously some women need vaginal hormones and systemic HRT. So any type of vaginal hormone is fine for women who've had a clot, isn't it? Yes. And then the natural hormones are fine as well. And certainly if you, if you put into search engine, balance menopause clot, We've got a, a booklet that we, we wrote, we co-authored with Thrombosis UK as well, and it's got references in it, and a lot of people find that really reassuring. The other thing is when people have a surgery, I, someone messaged me today through Instagram to say, do I need to stop my HRT because I've been told I need to because I'm having an operation? Yeah, and again, it's the same message, isn't it? And yeah. this comes from just... When, when HRT was prescribed with older types of yeah. HRT that was oral or synthetic. So no, you don't need to stop it. And I think this just makes me think of this really important point of making sure the information you're reading is reliable and up to date. Yes, because a lot definitely. of the leaflets you mentioned, they're, they're outdated, aren't they? Mm. Um, and actually, if you search on Google, you're pretty much going to get two sides of everything, yeah. aren't you? So it's just important to get your inf make sure you get information from the right places. And yeah. you know, like you say, just there's lots of balance uh, leaflets and mm. information on balance. Yes, yeah. yeah. So next question, someone wants advice on avoiding de developing type 2 diabetes. Does HRT make a difference? And type 2 diabetes is increasing exponentially, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it goes back to what we were saying about nutrition, you know, mm. and what we're eating mm. is so important. And just the key messages now, I think people are becoming more aware about ultra-processed foods and mm. how that impacts our health. But diabetes is an inflammatory condition at the end. Yes. We've got plenty of evidence that says that if you start HRT, it can help to reduce your risk of developing diabetes. Mm. But that's along with good nutrition, exercising. Yes. And I think definitely in the menopause, as we're talking about exercising, you know, also thinking about the type of exercise you're mm. doing. We always talk about incorporating strength-based exercise mm -hmm. and you know, weights uh, in your routine because we know that there's about a 10 to 15% loss of muscle as mm -hmm. a woman gets older. And muscle is so important to help us with insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. isn't it? So mm -hmm. I think it's all connected, I think. Our, yeah. our bodies are amazing Swiss clocks, aren't they? And it's yeah, just trying to think of it holistically yeah. in that way. And I think yeah. we have to remember, don't we, that our hormones, estradiol, progesterone and testosterone yeah are metabolically active in our body. So when we don't have those hormones, it is a cardiometabolic problem in yeah. that it affects our heart and our metabolism. Yeah. And we know there's an increased incidence of diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, the longer a woman is without her hormones. Yeah. And so a lot of people are then putting more pressure on themselves to eat better, to exercise, which is important, but you can't eat or exercise your way out of your menopause. No. Um, you can't replace those missing hormones. Um, so often when the hormones are rebalanced, we know this incidence, this risk of type 2 diabetes will reduce, yeah. 
and then optimize it even more with, with nutrition and exercise as well. Yeah. It makes a huge difference to people. Um, and we know just things like cholesterol will go down, the yes. bad cholesterol will go down, blood pressure will go down when people are taking HRT. Yeah, and a lot of times patients will tell you with the menopause, perimenopause symptoms, they just lack motivation mm. or energy, you know, and I think it's really difficult to say to a woman, well, you need to exercise more and eat better, you know, and yes. when, you have, when you're not feeling it's really like hard. even... It's really difficult. Yes, yes, so um, just... And also, those people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, actually, when they become menopausal, often their sugar um, control goes out yes. of kilter, um, and often they don't know why. So I've seen a lot of people that have needed to have more insulin or change in their medication, and no one's picked up that they're menopausal yeah. because of the way our hormones all interact together. So it is worth, if you have got diabetes, look if you're, and your mm. control's changing, think about hormones. Yeah. Definitely. So as we were, talk we were talking about this just now, actually, it's a perfect yes. question to lead on. And it's talking about strength training for older women during the menopause and weight loss. Is it really hormones or is it just getting a bit more lax in our older age? Well, yeah. it's actually a bit of both, really, isn't it? I, I recently went to Pilates class with my daughter and I thought I was quite strong. And I do far more exercise than her and she was doing a lot better than me. And I was suddenly thought... I really am old, actually, compared to her, who's lovely and young. But actually, there's a, there's a, it's a combination of effects. Obviously, ageing happens to all of us. We can't stop ageing. But we do know there is an accelerated in all our ageing processes without our hormones. So estradiol, progesterone and testosterone are very anti-inflammatory hormones. They reduce inflammation and they reduce the ageing process, yeah. um, which is really important, especially as you were saying, Pfizer, with our... Our muscle mm. and our bone, we get an accelerated loss of bone during the menopause and also this sarcopenia, so this loss of muscle mass, which is really important. Mm. And although you need to exercise, a lot of people who exercise well say that they're not getting the same muscle tone, they're yeah. not feeling the same after exercise yeah. um, and their stamina isn't so good either. And that can be a combination of all three hormones. But it is really important to exercise. A lot of us are sedentary in our jobs. I know I spend far too long on my desk and um, as many of you know, I do quite a lot of yoga. And actually most mornings I just do 15 minutes of yoga, ending with a headstand before I get in the shower. And it's only 15 minutes, but actually if I do that four or five times a, a week, that's like an extra whatever, mm. you know? Uh, and I do a longer practice on a Wednesday and at the weekend as well. But I have to force myself to get up um, and it's worse in the winter. When the, when the birds are chirping and the, <laughs> and the sun's out, it's easier. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's almost putting it into your timetable, I think, yes. exercise. Because when we get older, the time we have to ourselves really shrinks. Yeah. And I'm rubbish at exercising in the evening because I just feel more tired. If I exercise when I'm hungry, it will trigger a migraine. So, it, but that's me, that's what works for me. Other people, it's a lot better doing it maybe in an evening, but I do think it's having it as part of your routine is important, isn't it? Yeah, like brushing your teeth yes. or, you know, it's just part of your day. But I think muscle, I think particularly muscle is so yeah. important in later life, not just for, like we were talking about, ins uh, making sure you remain sensitive to insulin and, you know, your mm. blood sugar is well controlled, but also just for functionality, just being able to yes. get out of the chair and be able oh, to I move totally. around. And Whenever I have a bath, I think I always want to be able to get myself out of my bath. I don't want my husband or someone else to be pulling me out yeah. of the bath. So, Absolutely. But the other thing that's really important is our pelvic floor. Mm. Um, because externally there's all this thing about how we look and how our muscles look and how, we t how we're toned. And I see a lot of patients who physically, externally look amazing, but they cough or they sneeze and they leak urine. Yeah. And having your pelvic floor, so as you say, cleaning yeah. your teeth, do your pelvic floor exercises, really important to be looking at our core strength as well, yes, isn't it? Definitely. And I think that's the other thing just to say is that Sometimes in different cultures, that's kind of a hush and yes. it's accepted and no one wants to talk about mm. it because they're embarrassed. And so in my consultations, I'll always bring it yes, up. Yes, totally. And it's surprising how many people say, well, actually, now you ask. This is happening. Yeah. But they'll suffer in silence or just go and buy pads. Buy, or, buy pads because yeah. actually it's so normalised, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, um, my period stopped quite a few years ago, but w I was buying some tampons for my daughter recently and there were as many pads for mm. incontinence now as there are for sanitary protection and there was never years ago. It's yes. really increased and yeah. 
we shouldn't be putting pads in our pants if we're coughing or sneezing. We should be thinking, why is it happening? And mm -hmm. often it's pelvic floor, but also using vaginal hormones as well. So um, really individualizing exercise is, yeah. and it might need, as, as you said, it might need changing the type as we get older. Yes. So question here, someone's 67. She's been on HRT since she was 46. So she's now been on it 23 years, sorry, 21 years. Um, any problems? Can she stay on it or does she need to come off HRT? She can stay on it. Start with the good news. <laughs> and I think all of this, you know, lowest dose for the shortest amount yeah. of time, a lot of that has been debunked now. Yes, hasn't totally. It? And we, we yeah. view the menopause differently now. It really is just a hormone deficiency. Mm. So just as you, if you were a diabetic, going back to yes. that and needed insulin, then you'd have insulin for the rest of your yes. life. And I guess we should view it in the same way because it's not just about, well, I say not just, I mean, what's wrong with feeling well and feeling yourself and being able to do all the things that you've always done? That's really important. Your symptoms are obviously really important. But low hormones are associated with health risks, mm. aren't they? So it's making sure that you have that. And we know that actually, even at low doses, HRT will help protect your bones. It'll help reduce your risk of heart disease yeah. and so on. Yeah. All of these are inflammatory conditions. So Absolutely. And, and this lowest dose, shortest length of time has come from this WHI study. Yes. And there was a million women study as well, which has been uh, debunked really because it wasn't set up in a good way. It was more of an observational study. The million women study wasn't using the HRT that we prescribe now either. And it was in a different population. And this breast cancer risk that people still talk about with HRT actually isn't appropriate with the body identical hormones that we prescribe now. And even the WHI study, looking at the worst type of HRT with the worst statistics, the risk of breast cancer is vanishing low and not even statistically significant. Women who only had oestrogen actually had a 23% lower incidence of breast cancer when followed for 20 years. The natural body identical hormones have never been shown to be risk of breast cancer. So if you're thinking about risks with HRT, we've already said there isn't a risk of clot or stroke when you have the natural hormones, especially oestrogen through the skin. There's not likely to be a risk of breast cancer. There might be bleeding, which can be a risk but it's more of a side effect really yeah. isn't it which we can usually manage quite well um, so there isn't really risks with it with hormones anymore mm -hmm. the risk if is if you don't have the right dose because we know if people have too low a dose that's not right for them there's still inflammation so our immune cells are working all the time and there are things that make them work better and things that make them work, uh, work worse. So if the immune cells aren't working, you get increased inflammation, increased risk of these inflammatory diseases that Pfizer has spoken about. Whereas actually, we know from studies from decades ago that if people have low estradiol, then the, the, the immune cells are pro-inflammatory. They're programmed in a different way. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have adequate estrogen, it's very anti-inflammatory. And this is where this accelerated aging goes, if you like, because once our hormone estradiol drops, our immune cells don't work properly. Whereas once you have adequate estradiol, then it works well. And it's interesting. So around 30% of women who come to our clinic are already taking HRT. Yeah. And they come because they're still having symptoms. And there's a lot out there in media, social media, saying, well, HRT doesn't work. Um, it doesn't improve all symptoms. And that's often because it's not quite the right dose or type. Mm -hmm. So if your dose is too low or you're on the wrong type of progesterone, for example, you mm -hmm. might not feel well um, and you might feel that HRT isn't for you that type of HRT might not be for you mm -hmm. um, I know when I started HRT my dose of estrogen wasn't right and I felt awful and my mother-in-law kept saying are you feeling better I was like, no I still feel <laughs> and then my blood level of estrogen was still low um, my patches weren't sticking on very well yeah. and then I changed what I was using and felt so much better after a few months so yeah it's, it's making sure, and that's why we say do an annual review as well, isn't it? To Absolutely. make sure everything's optimised. And things change, and as you transition further into the menopause, it might mean that you need a different dose, yes. and you need a higher yeah. dose. And I think the perimenopause, it's a time of chaos, because your hormone levels are not only 
diminishing, they're also fluctuating. Mm. And then the menopause are low and stay low unless yes. you replace them. So I think, A, your dose might need to change as, as time goes on. But I think you've put a, raised an important point, you know, about patches not sticking or mm. if they become crinkly. And if that happens, then you may not be absorbing right. well. And then you might try a different preparation. I think... In the end, skin is designed to keep things out, yes, not let is. things in, yeah. like you always yeah. say. And so I think correct application technique is really important. So there's lots of things that can be done to adjust correct. Yes. Uh, you know, so the gel it might be an option for someone who mm. doesn't get on with patches, for example. So it's great mm. that we have options. Yes. But I think it's really important to find that right option for the for, for the individual patient. Yeah, absolutely. So, so next one. Next one is around. So if a female has always had low levels of female hormones, is it safe for her to go on to HRT? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. we're all different. Yes. And in fact, I was talking to someone, I was at an event at Warwick University talking about translational research last night. And um, we are all different, but we don't know how different we are, actually. Yeah. And many of us have probably had low hormone levels for a while, but we don't know because we don't test them. And one of my patients yesterday was desperate for me to test her, and she was perimenopausal, so her, she's still getting periods. And I said, the problem is, I can test your estrogen level, of course I can, but if it's normal, it doesn't mean that it's normal all the time. Yes. And it's like, if it was raining for five minutes of the day, and I was speaking to you on the phone, and said, oh, Pfizer, it's raining today, yeah. and you'd go, no, it's sunny. And just that five minutes, you know, that's yes. how you'd interpret, and it's the same with hormone levels. Yeah. And so, but there are a lot of women, increasingly I speak to, who have symptoms of low mood, reduced concentration, maybe some muscle and joint pain, poor sleep, they might have urinary symptoms, vaginal dryness, and reduced libido. And how many women are there who are testosterone deficient before they're estrogen deficient? Yeah. I think there's more than we think, yeah. because we don't go around testing testosterone levels, but we usually do baseline testosterone levels here in the clinic before we start testosterone, mm. and they're always low, aren't they? Yeah. They are always low. And I think it is a clinical diagnosis to some extent, yes. isn't it? And ho testing hormones can be useful. Mm. I think we usually we, I, I, well, certainly I do look at it after the, it started HRT, just yes. to get a sense of, are you, is the patient absorbing? Absolutely. So low levels can be quite, in, you know, yes. they help you uh, tailor the treatment. High levels, like you say, it could be that it's coincided with their own endogenous yes. levels are peaking. So, so it's yes. less less important or clinically relevant when people have yeah. normal or raised levels, especially in the perimenopause yes. because of these swings that can occur. Yeah. But I do see a lot of women, and myself included actually, when you feel better on HRT, mm. they often say, you know what, I wish I'd started it years ago. Yes. Um, but you don't know because symptoms creep on. So if there are women who have had low hormones before, of course HRT is safe. But often we'll start, and that's the beauty of mm. tailoring it, we can start with a very low dose. Mm. And the same if people are older starting HRT. Yeah. We usually start a very low dose, really, don't we? And yes. then gradually increase. And gradually increase. And again, back to the individualising the treatment mm. plan, isn't it, with, with the patient? Yes. So, and going back to the low hormones, actually, if you've always had them lo low, we know estradiol is such a powerful yes. anti-inflammatory. Yeah. You have cells for estrogen all over mm. your body. So it's going to help with lots of different yes. symptoms, isn't it? Yeah. And protect you, uh, your future health. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah. So a question from Australia. So thank you for those people who are not in the UK. It's great that we're reaching a global audience. And in fact, um, downloads from my podcast, downloads of the app is really global. And it's wonderful that we're all helping each other. So this question is someone who's had a migraine with Aura for two years, hasn't since stopping her monthly bleed, she's had four migraines in the last six months. She's been taking patches and the progesterone for five years to help with hormonal migraines migraines but what should she do can she change the dose what else can she do her doctor thinks her risk of stroke is now very high so she should stop all HRT what do you think of that so the, I think the first thing to say is you know is with migraine sufferers yeah. any change in routine can trigger a migraine yeah. it. indeed <laughs> it can yes migraines. Uh, and that's what I've learned from my patients. So I think keeping a symptom diary is so yeah. important, knowing what your triggers are. In the perimenopause, definitely, it's usually the fluctuating hormones mm. can yeah. trigger a migraine, yeah. can't they? But again, going this this worry about stroke, because now we give estrogen yeah. through the skin, the risk of, there, there is no risk of stroke. No. No, so people so. with migraine, 
thought to have a small increased risk of stroke, yes. but it's not going to increase further, is it, by no. having the natural hormones? No. The, I mean, their, their risk is their risk. Yes. It won't change Indeed. by, by yeah. having HRT on top. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, definitely not stop the HRT. Keep that going to protect your bones. But she might heart, need... So she, she's getting worsening... Uh, migraines and yes. sometimes the dose needs changing like we've said yeah. before it might be that she started HRT when she was perimenopausal and now her own hormones have, have gone so yes. she needs to top up more yeah. sometimes the metabolism of oestrogen can change as well yeah. but the other thing is testosterone too and there's no good research is there, there was a paper I read recently about testosterone and, and headaches and migraines mm -hmm. can reduce my clinical experience, definitely migraines um, can improve with um, testosterone, but also with progesterone as well, actually, because we know those hormones are very anti-inflammatory. They help reduce neuroinflammation, so inflammation in the brain as well, and they help improve the blood supply. Um, and so it would be great to do some proper research looking at the role of our hormones, estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone with migraine. Um, but certainly many of us find that our, that our migraines do improve on HRT once we're on the right dose and type but also looking at everything else like you say any change so um, looking at um, what we eat mm -hmm. looking at um, alcohol smoking caffeine some people don't get triggered I know lots of people with migraine who can drink what they like eat what they like mm -hmm. whereas I know if I eat processed foods if I drink alcohol it will trigger migraine so I don't do any of that and my migraine rules my life even though I don't get many because I know that if I change it will come yeah. um, but hormones are really common we see a fluctuation um, or uh, sorry an increase in incidence of migraine yeah. around um, the, um, adolescence yeah. don't we when yeah. hormones are chaos and then in women in their sort of 30s 40s 50s when the hormone levels are changing yeah and generally we this is why when we start hrt we tend to start slow and yes. gradually increase and that can help to minimize the risk of triggering a migraine absolutely well. especially in migraine often really yeah. slowly yeah. Um, increase so here's the next one for you, Louise. So can regular or moderate high alcohol consumption temporarily mask symptoms of low hormones uh, and help to manage symptoms of the menopause? Um, and does alcohol increase oestrogen levels and complicate attempts to decrease stop drinking? It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So there's lots of things to unpick, I think, with alcohol. I don't yes. know what you think. So. Yeah. Many people I speak to actually drink more alcohol because they want to numb their symptoms of yeah. the menopause. So a lot of people think that drinking alcohol will help us sleep. It often doesn't. It yeah. might help us get to sleep, but then the actual sleep quality is really poor when people drink. Um, and then a lot of people say, oh, I can't drink nearly as much. I get hangovers more easily or yeah. my tolerance isn't as good. And that's often the way our liver is processing the alcohol because mm. everything, liver's like a sieve, really. Mm. So when you drink alcohol or eat anything, anything that goes in our mouth gets sieved through our, our liver and our liver sort of helps protect our body from any toxins and break things down, including alcohol. And our livers don't work as well when we're um, older, but also our hormones are really important for how our liver functions. And so when we don't have the right balance of hormones, people find their metabolism of alcohol can be different mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so actually, it's not really a good thing to drink alcohol. Some people find it might mask their symptoms. It can interfere with oestrogen and hormone metabolism, but it wouldn't be used as a, as a treatment or a way of improving symptoms, would it? No, if anything, it's going to yeah. <laughs> kind of almost uh, spoil all the benefits yeah. of uh, estrogen because we know, you know, alcohol is uh, um, related to increased risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, yes. all of those things. All those inflammatory diseases. Um, and I think often women will use it as a crutch and it becomes a bit of a habit. And mm. that's, you know, when you're feeling really awful and having mood swings and feeling you know you're feeling really stressed out and then often we'll say gosh I, I didn't realize that yes. I've been using it as a crutch almost to cope with my symptoms but usually you know if you get them on the right dose of HRT etc hopefully that, that yeah. can, they can kind of regain some control over that but it is hard we know mm. that addictions increase during the perimenopause and menopause a lot of people I mean alcohol is a, often a hidden addiction yeah. for many people but it's very difficult to change when you're menopausal and having symptoms and using alcohol as a crutch. Mm. So often when people have their hormones rebalanced, they can then have a more frank discussion about maybe their alcohol. Or it might not be alcohol they're addicted to, mm. it could be other substances as well. Mm. 
but it, it's worth definitely working in conjunction with somebody who understands, mm. but also thinking about hormones as, as well. Um, a lot of people think that clinicians will judge them if they really admit how much they're drinking. And, you know, honesty is really important for me as a person, for my friends, for my family, but also for my patients. I will never judge a patient who drinks and I will respect them even more if they mm. are honest because we can work together. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that goes with everything, doesn't yes, it? Definitely. With all of the, all, because the end goal is that this is a time in a way that you can focus on your health. Yes. And it's an investment, isn't it? It's so really important. Yes. Yeah. It's about change and just living your a healthy life. Yeah. I think that's really key. Absolutely. And so do what's right well. for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, and we're not here saying that no one can, should drink alcohol, no. but people need to do what's right for them, and yes. that is the most important thing, absolutely. So this is a great question. This is a GP and a menopause doctor in Australia, another Australian person, but great that, you know, we, well, I get um, lots of messages every day from healthcare professionals and lots of emails. And it's great, actually, having like-minded people, not just in the UK, but globally, who can help as many people as possible. So this doctor is saying that she finds many patients need higher than the recommended dose of oestrogen as a patch or gel to manage the mental health side of the perimenopause menopause or menopause. When this person is discussed with other medical colleagues, they get a very firm no. They can only go above the, the doses for sweats and not mood. And the person saying, can I prescribe higher doses and are there any extra risks of prescribing higher doses? I think this touches on what we were talking about before. Uh, so giving oestrogen through the skin is mm. the safest way, but then everybody's skin is different. Yes. You know, and, and the, the, the dose doesn't always correlate with the blood level. I think mm. that's really important yes. to know. So um, just because you put four pumps of gel on doesn't mean you're going to get the equivalent mm. in, in your bloodstream. And often you do need a higher dose, don't you, with when you have mm. symptoms, mental health symptoms, just so it can cross the blood-brain yes. barrier. So I think it just goes back to really individualizing the dose of the patient. And mm. I guess four pumps a day is a maximum licensed dose, as an example. But that just means that's the that's the dose that the, the manufacturer uh, so, got yeah. the product on the market. Well, that's, right? that's exactly so. right. So when they're putting something to market, they yes. do some testing and work out what the the licensed dose is. Yes. But we looked at all the studies recently yeah. of the maximum dose of the gel and the patches. Yeah. And actually, each study involved less than forty women. Yeah. Only for four days they monitored and assessed. Now. I don't know about you guys, but I would never assess someone after four days of no. starting a patch or gel because it takes longer to have an effect. Um, anything can build up gradually and take a little while. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just seems nonsensical, really. And even when they did those studies, they showed that around a fifth of women would need a higher dose to get the same absorption. Yes. But also other studies have shown that absorption really varies depending on the location of where you apply the gel or it stick the patch yes. so if you stick it on your bottom compared to the skin of your thigh or your lower back the absorption will be different yeah. and as you said earlier our skin is a barrier yeah. like if it was good way of absorbing drugs we'd have loads of plasters of medication yes. because it bypasses the liver so actually you get the pure substance through yeah. but there's very few things there's nicotine patches there's fentanyl which is a type of painkiller there's not much else that no. we put through the skin actually so we're lucky that oestrogen is the right um, size that it can go through the skin but it means that the dose needs to vary so yeah. We've done a huge amount of, of audit looking at our patients and we do have um, around about, it's about 16, 18% of follow-up patients who need a higher dose to get the same amount absorbed. So we see people on lower doses who absorb more than pe some people with a higher dose. Yeah. Um, and it's, so it's not the dose, it's the, the amount that's absorbed into the body. Like I've already said, if your amount in your body is too low, you'll get symptoms but you'll still get inflammation in your body. And yeah. And that's certainly we increasingly see that, that people often do need a higher dose if they're still struggling with symptoms or their levels are low and they're not absorbing very well. Yeah. There's never been a study, as far as I'm aware, that a dose, a higher dose is associated with any risks or problems. Yeah. And we've gone into the minutia of it, mm. haven't we, in our audit. So we have looked at blood levels on, of, of women on different doses. 
And you know, it can be literally if you lined up 10 women and gave them the yeah. same amount of gel, you'd get 10 different blood yes. levels, wouldn't you? Yeah. And so there hasn't been a correlation between dose and, you know, Absolutely risk not. or no. Or and, and, and the other thing you were saying, actually, because this person was asking about mental health symptoms, and we know from Monitoring Balance App, mm -hmm. the commonest symptoms affecting the menopause or affecting menopausal women are the brain symptoms, so the low mood, the anxiety, the poor sleep, the cognitive problems. Mm. Um, and actually, there are some studies that show that women with schizophrenia actually and bipolar respond better to a higher dose of oestrogen. And it's probably because what we measure in the blood is not the same as what's in the brain. Um, anything that we put into our bloodstream has to go through this blood-brain barrier, yes. which is again like a bit of a protective cling film, if you like, because not everything that we have, we want to go straight into our brain. Um, so the, the blood-brain barrier is very careful, but actually, so it might be that some people need a higher levels. The other thing is, is that our brain produces these hormones as well. It's not all about our ovaries. Our brain produces these uh, hormones, estradiol, progesterone and testosterone. So to get the right amount in the brain might need to be a higher dose compared to what's needed to reduce joint pain, for example, or yeah. dry skin, yeah. because we're all different. And we don't know how much our brain produces, because there's no way of measuring oestrogen in our brain, is there? No, there isn't. But you know what the positive thing is, that we are starting to talk about these symptoms, because yes. before it was just menopause, is hot flushes and I night know. sweats. So, um, it is important, yeah. isn't it, that people yeah. know. Yeah, and then also having the testosterone on top, you know, not just thinking about yes. estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone can really help with those mood symptoms as well. And sometimes it's about, rather than just increasing the dose, it's about trying to get a balance and having all your hormones back. I think that's really key. Yeah, yeah. and that's exactly right. So often um, people think they need to increase the dose of estrogen, yeah. but when you talk to them and maybe do a blood test looking at their testosterone level, yes. you realise that they need testosterone as opposed to just increasing estrogen. Absolutely. So Absolutely. that's important. Um, the next question, uh, Louise, is for, for one for you, which is, because hair loss and hair thinning can be such yeah. a common symptom in uh, menopause, can't mm. it? And so there's a question about what shampoo should you be using in the perimenopause? It's great that question's been asked, actually, because we were talking about it before we started. And you know what? If you Google menopause shampoo, yeah. you'd probably fill your shopping basket three times over, wouldn't you? Yeah. And it's increased over the last eight years of menopause products. There's yeah. menopause face creams, there's menopause shampoos, there's menopause supplements, there's yeah. menopause chocolate even. You know, there'll be menopause toothpaste soon. But actually, this is just a marketing ploy because we know that um, there isn't anything specific about menopause um, skin or hair or um, it, it's some of it, like we've already said, is related to ageing, yes. of course. Um, but our skin can uh, and, and our hair can change so our hair can become drier we can we can the hair can run thinner yeah. it can become more brittle people yes. find that their hair can break yeah. having a good quality shampoo that's right for you is important but it doesn't have to be a menopause one it doesn't have to be um, labeled menopause and they're often more expensive actually when they're labeled menopause so i often say to people i don't know what you say yeah. that anything that's labeled menopause just don't buy it. <laughs> and we were looking actually with um, Saj Rajpal, who's the most amazing dermatologist we work closely with, and asking him um, about looking at the face creams and analysing them and seeing, is there anything specific for menopause in those, skin, in those products? And no, they're good for any ageing skin, but not for menopausal. So it, it is just a marketing ploy. And I think we just have to be really careful, you know, that we're not taking these things unnecessarily or just going for them because they've got the word menopause on. Yeah. Or they've got nice packaging or whatever. And if you're going to spend your money, then focus on fresh food, good yes. nutrition, avoiding processed well, foods. I think that's you know, really it's... important because... You know, we can slap all this stuff on us, yes. we can wash, we can do whatever, put these face creams on and yeah. they might help a little bit, but it's from within. Yes. And we have to remember that our skin and our hair are biologically active. Our, our skin is one of the largest organs we have. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of talk, and I, I was, one of our clinicians went to an event recently by an organisation who said, well, women are taking HRT because they want nice hair and it's a lifestyle drug. And that really saddens me, actually, mm -hmm. because... 
Women who take HRT often do have better skin because they have better blood flow through the skin, they have better collagen, um, they have less inflammation. But actually, if our skin looks good, so does our liver, so do our in organs internally because it's exactly the same process that's going on. Yes. And so I worry when I see people who, whose skin has changed in appearance because you think, well, what other organs are going on that are changing? Because we know it's all associated. Yes. So. There's another question about vaginal um, dryness. Someone said when they cough, sneeze, mm -hmm. a bit of leakage that we've said before, yeah. but just explain a bit more about vaginal hormones, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, vaginal hormones are... Uh, I, I always liken them to using factor 50 on your skin, Louise, yes. because it is a bit like that, isn't it? So they don't really count as part of your HRT because they're not absorbed into your bloodstream. But what it does help with is just keeping the tissue plump, keeping um, the tissue around your bladder, you know, plumper so you can hold more urine, you don't get leakage. Uh, it can help with lubrication so you're comfortable, you can wear jeans or mm. just function as you normally would. There's multiple benefits. And I think the other really big one to mention is how it can help reduce the risk of infection, of mm. course, as well. Absolutely. It, just by making the environment more acidic, balancing the good and bad bacteria. So multiple benefits mm. doesn't even count as part of HRT. Anyone can have vaginal hormones. Yes. You, know, you don't have to wait until you're postmenopausal or, or whatever. No, so there's a lot tricky. of young people that would yeah. probably benefit from vaginal hormones mm. more than we realise, actually. Yeah. And like you say, infections are really common. Most of us have had a urinary tract infection. Many women have had recurrent, so more than one urinary tract infection. And actually, if you look at sepsis, 30% of sepsis is due to urosepsis, which is sepsis due to urinary tract infection. Yeah. Costs the NHS millions, billions of pounds by people going in and out with infection. And people die, obviously, from sepsis, as we know, every year. And the vaginal hormones are really, really safe, and they're very simple, but we have a choice. Um, so we've got vaginal tablets, we've got vaginal pessaries, we've got gel, yeah. we've got cream. Um, most of these are made with oestrogen, um, but we've also got something called intrarosa, or prasterone is the other name, and that contains a hormone called DHEA, which converts to both oestradiol and testosterone. And it's really important, I know we've been talking a bit about testosterone systemically, yes. But testosterone works locally as well. So we've got cells that respond to testosterone on our vulva, our vagina, around our clitoris, but also in our urinary tract and our pelvic floor as well. So a lot of times, and over the last 30 odd years of being a doctor, I've only used, or I used to only give vaginal oestrogen because mm. that's all we had. Mm. And women would still sometimes get symptoms and then now we've got this other intrarosa prasterone, which will stimulate the testosterone receptors as well. I'm getting the most amazing results with women who use it. Mm -hmm. It's a daily pessary, yeah. but it's, it's wholly treating rather than half treating. Yes. And it has been shown to reduce incidence of urinary tract infections as well, hasn't yeah. it? And but then just to add, it's so important that it's you maintain it and carry on taking it. Because often women will feel better yes, and then stop absolutely. using it. So it goes back to what we were saying earlier about just having it in your routine. And it does take some getting used to with mm. HRT, doesn't it? Just because there are different preparations and we often give all hormones separately just so you, you yes. can adjust the doses. But the consistency is really important, mm. I think, that, uh, just to maintain things. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and knowing that people um, can change their dose and type of HRT, but also um, vaginal hormones might need to be added in at a later stage. So about 20% of women taking HRT will need to use vaginal hormones. Um, so just because you'll feel fine on HRT doesn't mean that it's going to carry on, need it, you're, you're going to carry on needing that same dose or you won't need vaginal hormones. So yeah. it is definitely, like you say, you always ask women, I know, about yeah. urinary symptoms, and we usually do in the clinic because sometimes people say, oh no, but I'm getting up three or four times at night. At night and, yes. and that's when you think, well, I often we'll try vaginal hormones, pelvic floor, sometimes seeing a specialist, a pelvic floor physiotherapist can be really, really helpful. Um, but it's everything in combination is so important isn't it? So important and I think this is probably, you, you say 20%, I wonder if it's higher mm, Louise probably. because women are just too embarrassed to bring I it know. up or just accept it don't they? And well so I think, I, I mean I've been to lectures where people say you only need to talk about vaginal hormones if people are in a relationship yeah. and that really worries me because it's not just about penetrative se sex, it's 
talking about urinary symptoms as well. But also, just going back to testosterone, we know we prescribe it because the, the, the guidelines say the evidence is when women have reduced libido. We often know that it can improve other symptoms such as mood, energy, concentration, stamina, because it works very well in our brain as a neurotransmitter. Mm. But quite a few women have contacted me over the last couple of months and say, I'm in a, I'm in, um, a same sex relationship or I don't have a relationship and I've been told that I can't have testosterone. And I find that's really quite um, misogynistic. It's very barbaric saying that women can't have a libido because they don't have a heterosexual relationship. It just doesn't feel right, does it? It doesn't feel right. It's not fair, especially no. because, like you say, it's not just about libido. No. Libido is quite complicated. Mm. It can take time to improve. Lots mm. of things affect libido. But I think with testosterone, one of the things that I hear patients saying quite a lot is that they get their mojo back or they're, yes. li- you know, and they yeah. feel motivated and they feel excited about things. And I think we always want, you know, ex- we all know, you know, of course, exercise is good for you. But I guess how do you do that without if your testosterone levels are really low, you know, yeah. so I think. It has so many benefits yeah. that it's unfair just to take such a narrow focus on it. Absolutely, and I think um, you know, if we're going to focus on one thing, yeah. as we're coming towards the end of the webinar, for International Women's Day, I'd like to think, what are we going to do in the year ahead? Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of us in the organisation and outside the organisation, women, men, healthcare professionals globally, have really worked to try and help educate so we can talk more about hormones. But testosterone in women is a forgotten hormone. And actually, testosterone is made from progesterone and oestrogen is made from testosterone. So we need testosterone to make our oestrogen, which is something that often people don't realise. Men have oestrogen, progesterone and testosterone as well, which freaks out some men. But actually, we have testosterone too. And so we need to be thinking more. We're hoping this year more research will be done in testosterone. We've got a huge amount of clinical data that we're writing up, showing actually how safe it is. Mm -hmm. But having the conversation about it being a sort of forgotten hormone, I don't think it's a bad thing really, is it? No, absolutely. And like we were saying before, it's so important to have a balance of all your hormones. And I think... In the end, it's about choice, isn't it? Mm. Some women may not want to have testosterone, but it should have the option to have it and try it at least to see if it makes a difference. And I think we have to move away from accepting things as just part of normal ageing. Yes. Um, And I've always been very interested in prevention because as a medicines optimization pharmacist, I forever spent my life trying to see if we could take people off medication that they didn't need anymore, right? And I always just think, God, wouldn't it be great if we could just go and and do something <laughs> before all of this yeah. happened and you ended up having so many different medications. So I think prevention is so key and all, all the hormones help with that. We know testosterone helps with heart, it helps reduce the risk of heart disease mm. as well, don't we? And yeah. not as much evidence as oestrogen, but we do have some Absolutely. evidence. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I, th- I think looking at prevention, when we're thinking about global health, how we can prevent disease rather than waiting for a disease yeah. to happen is, is really crucially important. Mm. So we've covered lots of information tonight. Um, Sorry about the technical hitch at the beginning. I hope that's been interesting and informative. And I really want people to feel included when we're talking about menopause and hormones for all ages as well. So no one is too young, no one is too old, no one is in the wrong country for this conversation, which we really want to keep going and explode over the next um, few months and years to come. So we can really improve the health of future generations as well as our generation. So um, log in to um, uh, balance-menopause.com. Lots of information there. They've got my weekly podcast as well and also obviously the free Balance app. If you just go to the App Store or Google Play and put Balance Menopause, you'll see it there. Um, and hopefully, with all these resources, we can really help you feel, be, feel very included and supported when it comes to talking about hormonal health. So thanks, Pfizer, for joining me today. It's been great. Thank Thank you. Thank you.